Yeah, so sort of move into that sort of solution part. We've done the like the painful part, the problem. Now we're moving into the good stuff, the solution. So uh, as an advocacy organization, uh, this is the definition of open access that, that Spark subscribes to and the one that we advocate for, um, which has two parts. Uh, the first is the free immediate online availability of scientific and scholarly research articles. So you don't hit the paywall, you get to, to access the article for free. Uh, but the second part of the definition that we believe, uh, you know, is every bit as important as the first, is that it comes with full reuse rights. Um, so Nicole uh, did a fantastic job at sort of giving you a primer for open licensing, and actually the specific license that Spark advocates for as sort of the proper license for uh, for open access to make it fully open, sort of the gold standard, um, is a Creative Commons attribution only license. Um, so you know you have full reuse rights, and just to drive home this point can repeat after BART um, that it takes more than just being free uh, to make an article open. And the reason we push so hard for this is exactly what Nicole was saying. It's, um, you know, these open licenses really turn, um, you know, these, these articles into something more than what they are individually. It essentially kind of creates uh, or turns uh, all of these, these academic research articles into a platform in and of themselves that can then be built on in new ways uh, that they couldn't if they were protected by full copyright or more restrictive open licenses. And I think one important sort of uh, analogy uh, for this to help illustrate what I mean is the Human Genome Project. Um, you know, I think the Human Genome Project has uh, generated some somewhere around seven to eight hundred billion dollars um, in investment and economic activity. And a lot of the reason for that is because the results are openly licensed, so that anybody can build on them for any purpose uh, that they want. There's no restriction on using them for commercial reasons or, or for anything else, and that allows people to do really interesting. Um, you know, uh, sort of new activities with them because they can create new business models based off of the Human Genome Project data as a platform in and of itself. And so that's why we advocate for fully open licenses for research articles so that researchers can do the same thing uh, for research. So some of you may be familiar with uh, IBM's Watson computer uh, that competed uh, against the grand champions of Jeopardy uh, and beat them handily, which was a fantastic party trick, uh, but it's certainly not why IBM built Watson, right? If you actually look at the commercials that they ran while, uh, you know, in between the actual Jeopardy, um, you know, they're talking about how great it would be if uh, all doctors had Watson, um, you know, by the patient's bedside to use, uh, you know, in difficult diagnostic cases so that they could leverage the entire corpus of medical research, um, you know, in making these diagnoses. And, you know, for IBM, maybe that's possible because they have, you know, buildings full of lawyers that can negotiate the rights to every single article with every single publisher. Um, but, you know, if you look at who, you know, the, historically where innovation comes from, Google wasn't built by IBM, right? It was built by graduate students. Um, and when it's that difficult to get access or to get licenses or the permission to do this kind of computational text mining or analysis, then it really restricts who can build these new platforms. Um, you know, that make a huge, huge difference. And so, you know, if you look online at Twitter, for example, you'll see lots of researchers really frustrated with trying to get permission to do computational uh, text mining uh, on articles because they have to negotiate, uh, you know, with the commercial entities that own a lot of these journals. And a lot of times, you know, they're denied, uh, you know, the ability to do this text mining, or in many cases it takes so long, you know, the researchers just don't have time. Uh, to do this, and so this is, I think, one of the reasons why we push for the second part of this definition that it's fully open, is to allow researchers, um, you know, the ability to do this text mining that we have the capabilities for, that we have the technology, but unfortunately we're just so restricted by copyright and the formats that these articles are made available in that, um, you know, even though we have the technology, we can't really bring it to bear. So uh, there are sort of two paths to uh, uh, sort of moving towards an open access system. One is to just publish in an open access journal that makes all of its content uh, openly available immediately upon publication. And then the second path, uh, sort of a transitionary path, um, is what's called self-archiving, uh, which essentially means publishing, uh, you know, uh, in subscription-based journals if you need to or wherever, uh, but then making a copy of your article freely available through uh, an institutional repository or uh, a subject-specific repository like PubMed. Um, so we'll delve into each of these paths uh, a bit more deeply. Uh, so first, there are uh, a little bit over 9,700 open access journals that are published today. It's grown tremendously over the last uh, couple of decades. Many of you might be familiar with uh, some open access publishers like PLOS, the Public Library of Science, uh, Frontiers, um, which now is owned in large part by the Nature Publishing Group, um, which I think illustrates uh, how commercial entities are actually moving into open access which is really interesting. Uh, if 
I guess for those of us that have been uh, involved in this movement for a long time, uh, you know, in the early days, people would talk about how open access was an ideology, that it wasn't a viable business model. Uh, and now we're in fact seeing, uh, you know, Nature Publishing Group, uh, you know, buying a large share of Frontiers. We're seeing Springer, which bought Biomed Central a number of years ago. Um, you know, the commercial entities are starting to realize that, uh, you know, open access is the direction uh, where things are really heading and that it actually is, in fact, commercially viable. Uh, there's a great resource called the Directory of Open Access Journals uh, that's online at doaj.org. That's uh, an index of all of these open access journals that they also try to curate by quality uh, as well. So I think it's helpful um, to delve into uh, a couple examples uh, of how these, these open access journals work. Um, one model uh, that the Public Library of Science and Biomed Central and Frontiers use um, is an article processing charge model where uh, you know, the necessary costs of publication uh, are covered on the front end as a service rather than on the back end as a subscription, which is good in an economic sense because uh, publishers have much less sort of power to set a price when uh, publication is paid for on the front end as a service. Um, you know, because again, as we discussed earlier, um, you know, as in a subscription model, they essentially have a monopoly over each and every article, and that's different when it's paid for on the front end. And the idea here isn't to make individual researchers pay, uh, but it, instead just to shift this cost. And so it's great to see uh, institutions like uh, many of the UC schools uh, establish open access funds to cover these fees for their authors. Uh, an increasing number of funders are also covering these fees for the researchers that they fund. Uh, some examples of the funders that do that are the National Institutes of Health, uh, the Wellcome Trust, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, and a growing number of other research funders. And actually, uh, the Wellcome Trust estimated that to cover all uh, article processing charges for all of the articles that its funded researchers produce uh, would cost them somewhere around 1% of their total budget, um, which they view as a bargain to make all of this research then that they spend so much money to fund then available to the largest possible audience to build on in turn to, uh, to grow its impact. But in fact, the, uh, it's only the minority of journals uh, that actually charge something to authors or to readers. In fact, uh, most journals, like this example, the Journal of Machine Learning Research, uh, don't charge anything uh, to authors or to readers uh, because so many of the inputs to these journals are voluntary um, and you know, the necessary costs that do exist in terms of managing the peer review process, copy editing, hosting the content online can be covered in other ways. Um, you know, so I think this particular journal, I believe, is housed within a department at MIT. They have a student that works as sort of their webmaster online. Um, you know, and a lot of the other, like the copy editing, is just voluntarily contributed. Um, and so the reason this is uh, my favorite example is for a number of reasons. One is that it was actually founded when the board of a subscription-based journal called Machine Learning actually resigned. Uh, almost all of them resigned uh, out of protest at the high cost of that journal and essentially established the, the Journal of Machine Learning Research as a replacement that would then be open access um, so that it could reach more people in its field, which is uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and they actually estimate that the uh, sort of cost per article is about $6.50. Uh, and I think if you actually read the post, uh, a large portion of that actually goes towards, I believe it's an accountant, uh, to make sure they, uh, you know, keep their books in order so that they can keep their nonprofit status. Um, and it's not a small uh, enterprise that actually publishes around 3,500 pages uh, per year and is uh, ranked in the 93rd percentile uh, in impact factor for its discipline of artificial intelligence. Um, and so there's a great blog post that's written by Stuart Schieber, um, who uh, was the head of the uh, Office of Scholarly Communication at Harvard um, and has been involved in publishing this journal. Um, and this is a, a bit.ly link, uh, it's bit.ly slash an efficient journal. And I think it's a really good example to sort of get into the details of how you make an open access journal that doesn't charge either authors or, uh, or uh, readers work. Um, a little plug for the e-scholarship, first plug of many for uh, the e-scholarship repository here at the University of California, but this is a, a list of the journals that are published through the e-scholarship platform, many of which I learned earlier today uh, are funded by the GSA publications, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, but I think there are around 60 plus journals um, that are available through uh, this platform. It's a great, I think, example of how librarians are starting to take control, um, you know, and help, uh, you know, in the publication process as well. Um, so that's the first path. Uh, the second path, uh, which I uh, mentioned in the beginning, is sort of a transitionary one. Um, is again self-archiving where you can publish in uh, most journals and then make a copy of your article, the text, uh, either pre or post uh, peer review, 
uh, made available online for free. There are now a little bit more than 2,000 repositories like eScholarship uh, around the world. And actually, I believe eScholarship itself was one of the very first institutional repositories uh, to be established, I believe it was in 2002. Uh, and in fact, the vast majority, about 72% of publishers, uh, will allow their authors to make some form of their uh, article freely available online. And I think this is something that a lot of uh, authors uh, you know, aren't as aware of as we would like, uh, because in a sense, you know, we have sort of the permission that we need to solve a lot of this, this problem, but people just aren't in the habit uh, you know, of, of depositing their manuscripts into repositories like eScholarship. And this data was pulled from a project that has a fantastic name. It's called Sherpa Romeo. Um, and if you go to their website, if you Google it, it's the first thing that comes up. Um, it's actually also a very good resource. Um, you can enter uh, the name of a journal or a publisher, and then it will tell you uh, the rights that you have as an author in that journal to make your work freely available. So it's a nice, uh, a nice tool when uh, you know, evaluating where you might want to publish uh, to see uh, what rights you'll retain in a subscription-based journal. Um, or in looking back at the research that you've already published and saying what you can make freely available. Um, so we've already plugged uh, eScholarship uh, as a fantastic repository, but you can see it's uh, gotten over 21 million views and has over 70,000 publications in it. And I think, you know, I uh, venture to say it's certainly one of the, the leading institutional repositories in terms of content. And we're really excited about a policy uh, that sort of works hand in hand with the repository, which many of you might be familiar with which is the system-wide institutional open access policy um, in, here in the UC system that essentially grants uh, the regents of the University of California a non-exclusive license uh, to the articles that the faculty here produce. Uh, and this is an incredibly significant policy. It affects, I think, about 8,000 faculty. Uh, and this policy alone, uh, hopefully once it's up and running, should uh, make somewhere around 40,000 articles each year freely available, which is tremendous. Um, the National Institutes of Health uh, has a policy that, um, it's a type that I'll talk about more in a minute, but uh, they require that all the research that they fund, which is about $30 billion a year, uh, to be made freely available within 12 months. And they estimate that that uh, leads to about 90,000 articles being made freely available. So this one system-wide policy is almost half uh, of the impact of the entire National Institutes of Health funding $30 billion a year, um, which I think is, is incredible. Um, and I think it's important to point out with these policies is that they have uh, a lot of benefits for faculty members. Uh, there have been dozens of studies that have shown a strong correlation between making an article freely available and a significant increase in the rate of citation. And there's actually some really interesting data from the first institution to have an institutional open access policy, which is the Queensland University of Technology down in Australia. Uh, and this is, uh, I stole a couple slides from their deputy vice chancellor, um, who's sort of their champion and cheerleader in chief for their open access policy. Um, and this is some data showing the increase in citation rate of a, s a select group of faculty uh, after their open access policy went into effect in 2004. Uh, so you can say here in 2004, this particularly fac particular faculty member uh, had her annual citation rate jump from 183 citations per year in 2005, right when that open access policy started, uh, to 570 per year in 2011. Um, and some of you might notice that it's sort of going down at the end, and the reason for that is that the data was pulled before the end of 2012 when this presentation was given, so not all the citation data was in, for those paying very close attention. Uh, another researcher, very similar shape, uh, saw their annual citation rate rise from 455 per year in 2004 when the policy began to roll out uh, to 1,941 in 2011. Uh, those were two uh, established researchers, uh, trend also continued for mid-career researchers as well. Um, this one saw their citation rate jump from 56 uh, to 268 in 2011. And so, uh, you know, in the presentation, uh, Tom Cochran was talking about how this was representative of the faculty members there and that, um, you know, it seemed kind of obvious that when you make, you know, your work freely available to anybody with an internet connection, uh, that more people read on it, read it, and then in turn more people build upon it, and then ultimately cite it. Um, so uh, expanding on that, uh, we've seen uh, research funders as well uh, put policies like this into place and require that research that they fund be made freely available. And this is a map of the 18 countries with at least one public research funder that has such a policy uh, in place. And there are uh, around 90 now uh, of these policies in existence uh, around the world. So here in California, there is a piece of legislation 
um, that would actually create one of these policies uh, here at the state level. Uh, it's called AB 609, would essentially require uh, that uh, research that's funded directly by the state of California, the resulting articles would then have to be made freely available online. Uh, this was introduced in the previous uh, legislative session uh, of the California Assembly, passed the, uh, the Assembly by a very wide margin, uh, went to the Senate, and unfortunately uh, did not actually make it out of committee. I think we missed it by about one vote. Um, a bunch of the, the legislators on the committee that it was uh, had jurisdiction took a walk during the vote and didn't vote at all. So it didn't, unfortunately, make it out. But it's uh, being sort of reconsidered in this current session. Um, so it actually doesn't have to pass the assembly again. It actually starts right uh, in the Senate committee where it left off. And there's some negotiations going on behind the scenes, but um, there's the potential for it to advance um, this year and something that we'll be working and have worked really closely with the UC system and the UC libraries in particular. Uh, to push this. It's also something that students have been uh, very involved in, particularly the uh, UC Student Association. Uh, there is similar legislation at the federal level um, here in the US. Some of you might uh, have heard of the White House directive that was issued last year in February that essentially extends that NIH policy that I mentioned to the rest of uh, federal agencies, uh, essentially requiring that uh, almost all publicly funded research in the US has to be made freely available within uh, hopefully 12 months, which is a huge, huge step forward. Um, the only issue with that is that uh, presidential directives are actually not that durable. Uh, so the next administration should, could just come in and decide that this is not a policy that they want to have and immediately overturn it. Uh, and so that's why we're still pushing very hard uh, for legislation that we have would actually codify this into law and make it much more durable as well as improve upon uh, the policy. So this is the Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act, or FASTER. And what it would do uh, would uh, essentially shorten the delay uh, by which the, the articles would have to be made freely available from 12 months down to six months. Uh, and then it would also require uh, the resulting articles to be made available in formats and under terms that allow for their productive reuse. Uh, so essentially starting to hint at the importance of open licensing and trying to, uh, to get licenses put on all of the research that our federal government funds. Uh, and as I alluded to, this is again something that students have been very, very involved in. Uh, there have actually been over a thousand congressional uh, lobby visits by students in the last four and a half years, uh, mainly led by the National Association of Graduate and Professional Students that uh, visits legislators' offices uh, twice a year and has this as one of their top issues and has really made a difference on. Uh, but there have also been other student organizations engaged like the American Medical Student Association. Um, so it's something that students have had an impact on at the federal level as well, as well uh, as at the state level here in California, where actually uh, a representative, uh, Meredith Niles, who was a PhD candidate at Davis, um, testified in the California State Senate um, in support of AB 609 uh, last year. Um, so that's sort of a view of <laughs> the solution uh, of sort of where things are headed, hopefully, with open access. And I will turn it back over to Nicole to talk about similar things with OER. Uh, the open education space is a little bit more varied and complex because when you think about it, so many things can be used as, as educational resources. Um, online ar articles from newspapers, uh, videos, assessments, obviously textbooks, and even research articles themselves are educational resources. So um, the, the pathways to open educational resources and the ways that they can be used are, are very varied. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about just the definition of what open educational resources are and then provide some examples of, of what uh, projects are doing to make resources openly available and what the impacts of that are for education. So the plain language definition of OER that Spark uses uh, is that um, open educational resources are textbooks and other academic materials that are published online um, for everybody to freely use, adapt, and share. And again, that's getting at the, the free, uh, meaning no cost, no barriers to access, and open, meaning the right to use the material. And uh, the specific meaning of, of open in the OER context uh, is uh, a, a, little, a little bit um, less strict uh, as it is in the open access research context. Uh, we allow um, a, a number of other types of licenses, but generally uh, the meaning of open in OER um, adheres to what we call the five R's. So the, um, <laughs> the five uh, rights. So, 
Uh, the first one is the right to retain, so uh, to be able to keep and control a copy of the material so there are no 180 day expiration dates. You're allowed to keep it forever. Uh, the right to reuse, so uh, use it in any context you want. Um, to revise it, meaning that you can actually take a copy of, say, a textbook uh, and take out a chapter uh, and put one in that, that you've written or that somebody um, that you think would better fit the course. Uh, and there's a great example of a statistics textbook that was published uh, by a professor from De Anza College uh, named Barbalowski. And uh, there was another professor using that textbook in her course, it was an open textbook, who felt like there was a chapter missing. So she wrote it. And uh, now that chapter is part of the open textbook that's available online. So uh, there's also the right to remix, that's the fourth R. So that means taking two open educational resources that have compatible licenses, so some licenses can't be mixed together, uh, but to take parts from each and mix them together. For example, if you wanted to take some YouTube videos and embed them in a textbook, uh, or if you wanted to take um, a, a series of open access research articles and compile them together uh, into a course pack and distribute that to students, uh, that's remixing. And then uh, the right to redistribute, redistribute is the fifth R. So uh, you always have the right to share uh, any open material that, that you either have a copy of or have modified a copy of. So, uh, and then yeah, as a final note, uh, in, in all cases with open licenses, it requires attribution uh, to the author of the material as they request that to be happen. So, uh, how, how, does, how is this playing out in the field? So the first example I want to talk about is open courseware. So this may be a term that many of you are familiar with, uh, and it's the idea that uh, our institutions are creating educational content every day, and especially at, at public institutions, the people creating them um, have a, a, a public mission as, as part of their job. Um, and the idea behind co open courseware is to enable uh, the, the professors and graduate students who are creating these materials, who want to share them, to do so in a way uh, that, that allows others to effectively access and use them. So the most prominent example is MIT's Open Courseware program, which launched uh, a little over a decade ago and uh, was uh, really about MIT opening up uh, the great instructional materials that they produce <coughs> and allowing people across the world to see the quality of an MIT education um, and actually benefit uh, from their world-class expert faculty. And since that project launched, they've uh, released uh, materials for uh, over 2,000 courses, and uh, over 100 million people have visited their website. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, uh, about uh, a million people visit their website um, each month, and another half million people visited translated versions of open courseware materials from MIT and other parts of the world. Um, and this speaks to one really important aspect of open licensing, which is that it does allow translation. Um, and it does allow a, a, a digital resource to have a broader reach uh, in that respect. And there are, there are dozens of institutions, uh, hundreds of in institutions across the world that are, uh, have established this kind of program. Uh, and the Open Education Consortium represents over 200 of them um, and has an index where you can find specific projects. And then just one other example I wanted to highlight that's, that's interesting for the medical context is the University of Michigan's Open Courseware program called Open Michigan. Uh, they're actually um, taking their medical curriculum and putting that online for, for uh, everybody to use under an open license. And um, I wanted to highlight this one in particular because I've, I've been in a number of student meetings where I talk about this project and medical students are, are like, oh, hey, I've used that before. So it's a project that's actually widely used by students who are studying medicine both here and across the world to supplement their, their education, uh, which is another benefit that, that open educational resources offer, which is that anybody anywhere can use them. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, they discuss the, the students that I've spoken with um, at, at various conferences have discussed the videos that come with this project. Um, 
uh, it's, it's helpful to see a lecture, you know, even though they're hearing from their own faculty members to get that information in another way. So, and this project is actually partnered with uh, an African organization that's helping to disseminate um, their medical curriculum in Africa, where it can be adapted to fit a more local context um, and uh, also provides a lot of really valuable information. So uh, another uh, way that open educational resources are being created and used is through uh, general repositories. So we talked about materials that are created at institutions and, and institutional programs to get those materials out. But um, actually, there, there are a number of projects out there to uh, enable anyone anywhere who has expertise to publish material they've developed openly. Uh, and the example I want to highlight is Connections, which was founded by uh, Professor Rich Baranek from Rice University, uh, who uh, saw the potential to uh, make, it, make educational materials um, uh, available for everybody, not only to, to see, but to break them down into little pieces and allow users to assemble them into textbooks or courses. So he built a platform called Connections that where anybody can post material, and then anybody can go in and use the tools of that platform uh, to edit materials, which is allowed under the open license that the materials are under, uh, to collect them into, well, they're called collections, uh, and share the collections they've created with anybody. So it's a really, uh, a really useful way to share materials. Uh, and then these are just some examples of, of the type of materials in there. So uh, I want to move on to uh, talking again about textbooks. So we all know that in higher education right now, textbooks are the primary uh, mode of instruction. That's still the, the main resource that's assigned. And uh, over the years, the open education movement has started to focus a little bit more on producing textbooks as opposed to just you know uh, vast amounts of content that anybody can use, but producing resources that a professor could actually just take off the shelf and assign in their course. Um, and then open publishing is the term that we use to refer to um, uh, projects that are developing materials that um, are published in kind of a, a traditional following the traditional publishing model in the sense that there's peer review and, and they're nicely typesetted um, and uh, uh, they can compete with traditional materials. And the project I want to highlight actually grew out of the Connections platform that I just mentioned. It's called Open Sax College, uh, and again based out of Rice University. They're developing 20 open textbooks for high enrollment courses, so subjects like biology and chemistry, where there are hundreds of thousands of students taking those courses every year. And the textbooks are extremely expensive, and, and, and the capacity for savings is in the millions. Um, and the interesting thing about this project is that it's building a sustainable model to support publishing, because of course you need to keep materials up to date, and you need to compensate authors for the time uh, that they invest in, in developing this work. Uh, so far they've published, I believe, six textbooks, last time I checked, um, and heading up to 20. Uh, the books are available in print. Um, and it costs about $30 to get a hard copy of this particular book, Soci Sociology, uh, if you want it. But the great thing is that the book is available in PDF for free. And you can put it on an iPad, a smartphone. It gives students lots of options uh, to access it. And um, in a number of courses that have used open textbooks from this and other projects, there have been efficacy studies looking at how do students do when they use an open textbook versus a traditional textbook, where um, instead of you know, choosing between a $200 textbook and a $90 ebook and, and not buying the book at all, uh, instead they have the option to access a PDF or, or a, a free download or a low cost print copy. What's the difference? And um, a number of those studies have found that in fact students do better when they're using an open textbook. They get higher uh, final scores on their, on their exams, they get higher grades, and there are lower withdrawal rates, so students are dropping out less. And there are many factors that can contribute to it, but the biggest conjecture is that, well, students have access to the material, and if they have access, they can learn from it. So uh, that's the impact of open textbooks and developing materials like that. And then back to OpenStax College, they've gotten uh, the materials adopted at over 200 institutions across the world. 
and have saved students $2.3 million to date, but that number is going to grow rapidly um, as, uh, as the semesters continue to be added to it. And then before we move on into the next section, I just want to highlight one more way that, that open educational resources are being uh, uh, supported and developed, and that's through public funding. So there is a really strong public policy case for open educational resources because, well, first of all, our governments already heavily invest in education through financial aid, through student loans, Pell Grants, um, at the state level, Cal Grants. Um, so mo that money is going towards textbooks. Uh, in many cases. So uh, to reduce the overall cost of higher education, there's a strong case there. And there's also a really strong case for programs that are developing educational resources. Just like research, if we invest in research, the results should be openly available to the public. It's the same for educational materials. Uh, and one project you may have heard of is the Open Course Library in Washington State, which launched in 2011. Um, they developed 81 uh, high, uh, materials for 81 of their highest enrollment community college courses uh, to have materials that are $30 or less, and anything new that the course developers created needed to be under an open license because, of course, it was developed with public funds. And that project has saved students $5.5 million to date. Uh, and that was at the, as of the end of the last academic year. For this, the end of this academic year, it's over seven million. Uh, here in California, many of you may, may be familiar that there was a similar piece of legislation passed in 2012, uh, setting up a faculty council to oversee um, 50 open textbooks uh, for high enrollment courses. And that faculty council is now up and running, and Cal State is going to be in charge of constructing the library to hold those materials. And then finally, some of you may have heard of the Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Labor's uh, uh, TACT program is how we pronounce it, possibly one of the most ridiculous acronyms <laughs> that has ever been chosen for any program. <laughs> but um, it's a $2 billion investment in uh, improving workforce training programs. And the Department of Labor uh, decided that, well, if we're going to have people improving workforce training programs, we should allow other community colleges to uh, take advantage of those innovations that they develop. So as a condition of uh, receiving grant funds through this program, uh, grantees need to agree to make any materials they develop available under an open license. So anyone anywhere in the country or the world uh, can take advantage of it. So a great example, and then expanding this kind of policy uh, government-wide is, is something that uh, SPARC is um, a policy that uh, SPARC is working towards. Okay.